All right. Thank you for that introduction, Jason. Can everybody hear me and see me? Awesome. So as Jason said, my name is Kelly Cherfitch, and I am a community development specialist here in the Abington field office. And I'm new, the new environmental contact person for the PAAO office. So that's why I'm giving this presentation today. Next slide. I know that not everybody is as excited about the environmental review process as I am. So I hope everybody had a good lunch and you're ready to get started. Um, I tried to have a little bit of fun with this title because like I said, it's, the environmental review process is pretty daunting and can seem overwhelming, but just like with anything, as long as you continue to do it and learn, I feel I have all the confidence in you all being able to do it. So that being said, this is To Air is Human, the what's, why's, who's, and how's of the environmental review process. And let's go ahead and get started with the most important question, and that is, first and foremost, next slide, exactly what is the environmental review? And at the most basic level, an environmental review is essentially exactly what it sounds like. A project is reviewed before any actions are undertaken to determine the impact on the environment. Now, while that's a pretty good definition, pretty good boilerplate definition, HUD goes a little more into detail, and HUD states that an environmental review is the process required under the National Environmental Protection Act of 1969 and all related acts to determine if any project expending federal funds will negatively impact the environment. <laughs> we'll discuss NEPA and the related acts a little further along in the presentation. And now, since we have went ahead and defined what is an environmental review, we're going to go ahead and define, next slide, what is the environmental review record? Now, the environmental review record, or the ERR, is a documentation that is compiled from completing the environmental review process. Um, the environmental review serves several important functions, and they are to provide the public and officials a way to judge environmental impacts before any dirt is turned and before any money is spent. It also helps to tell the story of the project, and it leaves a paper trail that shows a due diligence for any potential future problems. And that last slide, the paper trail, is an important concept I'd like to bring up, and if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. Now, this is a phrase that I know every single one of you all are tired of hearing, and you've heard it ad nauseum, but this is an especially true caveat for the environmental review record, and that is that we have to document everything that we do during the environmental review process, because if any problems arise, you can show that you did your due diligence and that you did what you were supposed to. So next step or next slide, rather. So these are the things that the environmental review record needs to contain. It needs to contain the project description, the statutory checklist, the environmental checklist, maps, public notices, and documentations of determinations or findings. So we're gonna get into the project description and statutory checklist, environmental checklist bullets a little later on in the presentation. But I want to go ahead and delve into the MAPS bullet point very quickly. Um, it might seem self-explanatory, but we see a lot of issues with the MAPS and the environmental review record. Sometimes the MAPS are teeny, teeny, tiny, and I can't see them. I wear glasses. Sometimes the level of detail is not explained properly. Sometimes, you know, the information, we don't know what the MAP is supposed to show. So please. When you include your map, say what it's supposed to show. Tell me if you're using a color code, what your color code is for, and just explain your maps. And now that I've thoroughly rambled on about maps, let's go ahead and talk about the public notices bullet point. And the public notices, and if you're not familiar with what they are, don't worry, we'll talk about them more in depth in, later on in the presentation, but any public notices that are published or posted need to be in the environmental review record. Uh, the public notice portion is a fairly significant part of the environmental review record, and if you don't do it correctly, it can significantly delay a project. So make sure that your public notices are in the environmental review record. 
And for the last bullet point, the documentation of determination, although that seems very confusing, it's a lot of words to say that that bullet point is any and all correspondence between regulatory agencies and grantees and locality. So letters to DEQ, DHR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, etc. Now, continuing on, the environmental review record has to be available for public review. So if the ERR, if the main chance is for it to provide the public a chance to review it, it has to be available to the public. And that means it needs to either be in the town hall, the municipal building, or the county administration office. Now, a little side note, in the times of COVID, because all these buildings are not currently open to the public, you are allowed to publish, in addition to having it in a building, you're allowed to put your environmental review record on your website. You just have to make sure in your FONSI that you put what website it's available at. And not only physically does the environmental review record need to be available for public review, but it also needs to be accessible to anybody coming off the street. So we don't want to use a lot of excessive jargon or it, the average Joe should be able to pick up the environmental review record and reasonably be able to review it. So for example, if you have in your environmental review record that buildings in the downtown project are not considered historic, you need to say where that documentation can be found in the environmental review record. So next slide. So with our environmental review and our environmental review records thoroughly defined, we need to reiterate why exactly we do environmental reviews. And that's because if we understand the purpose, it'll put you in the correct mindset while you're completing an environmental review. So we complete our environmental review because, not only because of its federal law, but we want to preserve the integrity of the environment. And we also want to protect the integrity of the project. So we all know that a project can harm the environment, but what about when the environment harms a project? We don't want to use federal funds, AKA public dollars, to pay for a project that might not stay around. So for example, when dealing with a housing rehabilitation project, we don't want to rehab a house and then put it right back in a flood zone. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So that intent of protecting the environment and the project is why we have the National Environmental Protection Act of 1969. And we're going to go into that right now. Uh, next slide. The National Environmental Protection Act of 1969 is usually commonly referred to as NEPA. And you can think of that as the umbrella that encompasses all the environmental factors for an environmental review. Um, there are also related acts and agency-specific regulations that we will get into. All federal agencies must implement their own agency-specific systems. So for example, for CDBG, HUD, uh, CDBG funds, HUD has its own agency-specific related acts. Next slide. So those related acts are up here on this slide, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but as I stated, the HUD-specific requirements are runway clear zones, flood insurance, and coastal barriers. And I'm going to go ahead and point out that Section 106, so when you have to contact DHR and see if there are any historic buildings, that falls under the first bullet point of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Oh, and I apologize, my office is right beside a railroad, so I'm going to pause for just a minute and let that. A quick railroad break for you. One second. That's capitalism. Western Southern. At its I can't hear you, Jason. There's a train. <laughs> All right, I think think we're about done. Okay, so now that we have a good background of the what's and the why's, we're going to talk about the how's of how to complete the environmental review process. Or excuse me, not the how's, the who's. Next slide. <coughs> so who is responsible for the information in the environmental review? And that would be the responsible entity. And the responsible entity is the unit of generalized local government who is the grantee with the HCD. 
So for all CDBG projects, that would be either a town or a county, and that is because HUD funds are required to go to UGLUG, and that's a fun little acronym for you all. You know, the generalized local government is commonly referred to as UGLUG. Now, for ARC projects and projects where the grantee is a nonprofit, DHCD would assume the responsible, the role of responsible entity. That is only in case the local government does not want to do that. Oops, one second. And uh, the responsible entity is the one who certifies and maintains ownership of the environmental review record. So most of our partners and grantees hire consultants such as or work with PDCs, regional commissions, a &E firms, et cetera. They, even though they complete it, they are not the ones responsible for the environmental review. And the responsible entity would be culpable for any inaccuracies, and we hope this isn't the case, but any lawsuits that may potentially arise. And that is why it is important for responsible entities to communicate thoroughly with their consultants. And this brings us to who acts as a certifying officer for the responsible entity, and that is, next slide. The certifying officer for the responsible entity per section 102 of NEPA is the highest ranking elected official. So for a town, that would be a mayor. For a county, that would be the chair of the board of supervisors. And you must delegate Excuse me, you can delegate other government officials such as a town manager or a county administrator, people that are more involved in the project. You can delegate them to be <clears throat> the certifying officer, but it must be in writing and it must be in your environmental review record. We have issues sometimes where someone has been delegated and that information has not been included in the environmental review record. So please make sure to include that. Furthermore, the certifying officer must have the technical capability capacity, whew, words are hard, and the administrative capability to carry out the environmental review duties. And if that's not the case, the newly delegated CEO can then further delegate responsibility of the actual conduction of the environmental review by hiring a consultant. So that's our PDCs, our A&E firms, and our regional commissions. But it doesn't matter who conducts the environmental review, the certifying officer and the responsible entities are the ones responsible for the content of the environmental review. So ultimately, grantees can delegate authority, but not responsibility. So the certifying officer would carry out and sign the request of release of funds and certification, which is a HUD-specific requirement, and, and this is an important, and they would accept jurisdiction in federal courts for the responsible entities, which means, to put it bluntly, that the certifying officer would be the one going to court if I hope this doesn't happen. There is a lawsuit, so keep that in mind. So now that we have the who's out of the way, let's get into the how's. Next slide. And before we delve straight into the how portion, I'd like to just pause and talk about the timing of when you actually complete your environmental review. So prior to getting under contract with DHCD, you have to complete your environmental review. Ideally, you would do this in the project development phase, so before you even apply for funding from us. And this is not only because the environmental review can take quite a while, but also we can see if the project is feasible. You want to make sure you're not building in a floodplain, for example. But since we don't live in an ideal world, usually you complete the environmental review during the pre-contract phase. And this next part is very important, so everybody pay attention. DHCD cannot issue a grant contract until the environmental review is fully complete, which means steps one through four on this chart are done. So speaking of this chart, this is the basic breakdown on how to complete the environmental review process. We'll start with step one, which is to define the project and scope. We'll move on to determining the level of review. We'll explain how to conduct the review. And finally, we'll publish the notices and submit the request of relief of funds and the certification, if that's applicable. Next slide, please. So the first step of the process, which is to define the project and scope, is the groundwork for everything you do for your entire, uh, your entire environmental review. So your project description is what you use to determine your level review and to complete all the steps. So this is really the most important step of the environmental review. So you have to be concise and thorough. 
and you must include all the information that I've included on the slide, which is the project name, the type of construction, the specific location, the types of activities, and the time frame. So obviously we need to have a project name and we need to make sure if this is a multi-phase project, what phase of the project is it? You need to define what type of project it is. So is it a housing project? Is it infrastructure? Or is it downtown facades? The location of the project might seem like a given, but we do run into the issue with a location that is too broad and is part of the part of the project description. So for example, for a sewer installation project in the town of Possumville, you cannot just say sewer installation project in the town of Possumville. You need to say where it's actually taking place. So in the blah blah neighborhood, town of Possumville, sewer installation. Um, we also need to have the size of the project, how many units are being constructed, how many linear feet, etc. We need the type of construction. Is it new construction? Is it rehabilitation? Is it conversion? Is it replacement? What are the type of activities that we're going to do? What services will be provided? Who will be served? How many will be served? And will there be any relocation? And we need to see how long this is going to take you to do. So how long is the time frame? But keep in mind, everybody, this list is not all inclusive. And as I stated before, we run into quite a few issues with the project description. Most of the time, it's not thorough enough. So just keep this in mind when you complete it. And also keep this in mind that the project description must detail the exact use of funds and that funds cannot be used for any activity that is not in the description. So be thorough and concise. Next slide, please. So now we're going to get into determining the level of review, which is step two for how to complete the environmental review process. And these are all the possible levels of review going from the least in depth to the most in depth. So we have exempt, which is the least in depth, categorically excluded, not subject to, which is often referred to as CNST, categorically excluded subject to, which is CEST, the environmental assessment, which is EA, broad level tiered review, and the environmental impact statement. So we'll get into each level of review on the following slides. Next slide, please. So for the first two levels, the exempt and categorically excluded, not subject to, I have them together because the environmental review is completed the same way for both of these. Um, they have the same requirements and both follow the same certification process, but they are two different levels. And I know that that's slightly confusing, but the biggest distinction between the two is that there are different eligible activities under each level. And both of those types of activities for either exempt or categorically excluded, not subject to, are deemed not to affect the human or physical environment. So in layman's terms, if you're not turning dirt, it could be either one of these projects. So now I'm gonna give you some examples of what are qualifying activities for each category. But I want you to keep in mind that this is not the end all be all list. So if you have, if you need further guidance, can call your CDS or make sure to consult the manual or the HUD exchange website. So some qualifying exempt activities would be costs relating to administration, the purchase of tools or equipment, costs associated with completing environmental engineering and design plans, or public services that don't result in any construction or physical changes, such as education, counseling, healthcare, et cetera. So one of our DHCD projects that is considered an exempt project would be Tazewell County's Automotive Service Excellence Program at the Southwest Virginia Community College. In that project, we're using federal funds to pay for tools and administrative costs so that students can receive training to become certified mechanics. So that is an example of an exempt uh, project. So let's move on to uh, categorically excluded, not subject to. And these some qualifying activities for a project that is categorically excluded, not subject to, would be operating costs, staff training, economic development activities, short-term tenant-based rental assistance, and home buyers assistance. An example of a DHCD project that would be categorically excluded, not subject to, would be our new rent and mortgage relief program which pays past due rent or mortgages for people that have been affected economically by the COVID-19 crisis. So like I said, well, it seems 
kind of confusing on how to distinguish which projects are exempt and which are categorically excluded, not subject to. The biggest takeaway is to consider what activity is being undertaken. And I'll reiterate this again. If you're unsure on which category your project falls into, don't hesitate to contact your CDS or look in Appendix 2 of the manual. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the next level of review is categorically excluded subject to. And this category is for projects where there is construction that involves replacement or renovation of existing facilities. And so this is where we're not disturbing land that was not previously already disturbed. Or we're not disturbing the environment because it's previously been disturbed. So some activities would be either acquisition, repair and improvement, reconstruction or rehabilitation. And one of the best uses of this category is the replacement of water lines and sewer lines or renovating old facilities so that they can have a new purpose. Facades and housing rehab projects could potentially fall into this category, but not always since there are always caveats to every different project. So once again, check with your CDS prior to completing your environmental review if you have questions. Next slide, please. The next level of review is the environmental assessment. And this is for projects that have new construction, um, significant expansion, or even if the cultural environment is going to be disturbed. So a good rule of thumb is if you turn dirt, you'll do an EA. And the majority of projects that we fund do fall into this category. Next slide, please. The broad level tiered review is kind of an a variation of the environmental assessment and it's most commonly used with downtown facades in a historic district and while there may be other types of projects that this is applicable to you know there are always variations to the rules but roughly a broad tier review is essentially dividing the project into multiple phases so you would roughly the process would roughly go you consult DHR and sign a programmatic agreement you complete your statutory checklist and consult with your regulatory agencies You'll do a variation of the combined notices and you'll issue a request of release of funds and certifications. And you will continue doing that process until you finish doing all the facades in your project. So if there are 20 facades and you parse them up into five facades per, you'll do it four times. So like I said, um, this is mainly for projects in downtown historic districts, but maybe there are other ones that could fall into. Next slide, please. Now this level of review is the most in-depth level of review and it rarely comes up for DHCD, but it does have the potential to. And an environmental impact level of review is for really big projects, usually, such as highways, bridges, airports, or facilities with more than 2,500 units or bed, beds. And DHCD does not typically fund these projects, but, and there's always a but, an environmental impact statement can come up if there is significant impact to the environment from a project. So for example, if there was an unknown archeological feature that was not known until digging began, maybe you found the lost city of Atlantis, who knows, but you would be under the EIS level of review. And an environmental impact statement has the potential, and it's a fairly high potential, to stop a project completely. So it is important to let DHCD know if you have a project requiring this level of review. Um, we can work with you to determine mitigation measures, if we can move the project, or to come up with a new course of action. Next slide. This is a chart that is available in the Grant Management Manual in Appendix 2, and it gives us a really good visual breakdown as to how the environmental process should be conducted and how each level of review is completed in a slightly different way. So at the top, for every, le uh, for every level of review, for every single project, we have to do our project description. And then as you can see, as we move from left to right, it gets more in depth for each level of review. And this is a very handy chart to have if you're completing your environmental review. And I would strongly suggest if you do a lot of environmental reviews, just print it out and sticking it up on your bulletin board. I have one on my bulletin board and it is very handy. Next slide, please. So now we have gotten to the step, step of how we actually conduct our review. And for exempt and CENST projects, 
what we have to do is we don't have to publish anything. We don't have to pub post anything. You have to document your finding in your environmental review record. You have to complete and submit a certification of exemption, which is found in Appendix 2BA of the Grant Management Manual, and then you'll proceed with the project. But that's for the EV project. So for every other project, next slide, and this is for projects that are categorically excluded subject to environmental assessment and broad level tiered projects, you begin conducting your research. So you'll start with your statutory checklist and your guidance thresholds. And then if you need more information, you'll use the internet, make some phone calls, go to courthouses, planning offices, wherever logic and reason dictate the research you need to conduct for these levels of review. So remember that this information that you get from this step is used to make your determinations and you must show that you're exercising and demonstrating due diligence. Next slide, please. So speaking of the statutory checklist, I want to give you a bad example of what a statutory checklist looks like. So if this is your first time looking at a statutory checklist, you'll notice there are boxes on the left, which are things that we need to comply with. And for this one, that I have used as an example, we're using airport hazards. So you put that you do not have to comply with an airport hazard, but we've left this box on the right completely blank. So if I'm Joe, anybody from the street, and I wanna pick up your environmental review, and I'm looking at your statutory checklist, and if I don't know anything about the project or the area, how, how do I know? Why, why are there no airport hazards that we need to comply with? So we've left it blank, and that's a very bad example of a statutory checklist. But next slide. If we look at a good example, we have seen that there we've checked no, there are no airport hazards. And we say why well, we've checked no, and that is the project is not near an airport. And you would look at Appendix 5 to see the map showing this. So, you know, like I said, an environmental review record needs to show why you've made the determinations and just leaving <laughs> and just leaving the boxes blank is not how you show you've made the determinations correctly. And the statutory checklist is available not only in our manual in Appendix 2A, but also from the HUD website. Next slide, please. So in conducting your, your review, you always have to con consult with our State Historic Preservation Office which for Virginia is the Department of Historic Resources. And you usually have to, or potentially have to consult with your Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And that is to complete the Section 106 requirements. So Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act requires federal agencies and responsible entities to take into account the effects of their projects on historic properties and afford a reasonable opportunity to comment on a project. So remember we talked about this earlier when we were talking about the related acts of NEPA. And as a side note, if you've done a lot of environmental reviews, Laura Lavernia is no longer our DHR contact and that is now Timothy Roberts. In addition to your Section 106 requirements, you also must determine if your project is or is not in the floodplain or wetland. And you have to provide maps with your project area clearly defined used to make your determinations. And if you determine that your project is in a floodplain or a wetland, you have to conduct the eight-step process. And that process is in Appendix 2 of the Grant Management ma Manual. And you also have to disseminate your publications of the eight-step process to your regulatory agencies and document it in your file. And this takes some time, both the Section 106 and the floodplains and wetlands. So make sure that you start early for this. Next slide, please. So in also conducting our research, you have to identify any tribal entities that may have an interest in your project and send them a consultation letter with a detailed project description. So when you do that, you have to make sure your letter is on your responsible entity's letterhead because it needs to be governmental to governmental um, correspondence. And there's additional information and a sample letter on that in Appendix 2J of the Grant Management Manual. Um, you also need to only write letters to agencies that you have identified as having a potential issue in the environmental review record. But you have to provide documentation of whatever source was used to make your decisions and determine compliance. Your source documentation needs to be credible, 
verifiable and relevant. And all your correspondence and public notices must be underneath the responsible entity signature on their letterhead. So if you're using a consulting agency, don't use their letterhead. And uh, we get a lot of questions about this step of the environmental review process. Um, how, long does, how long do you have to wait before you hear back from a regulatory agency? And unfortunately, no one's going to like this answer, but um, as long as it takes. The ball is in your court to get information back from, from the regulatory agency. So if it's been a while, you know, call them, email them, et cetera. But the, it is the onus of the responsible entity to get a response. Kelly, Next we slide, have please. Yeah, I'm going as fast as I can. It's a lot to get through. So once you have completed your statutory checklist, and you determine that you have no regulatory agencies that need to be consulted, meaning that you are in compliance with all of them, then your environmental review will convert to extent, exempt and you'll document accordingly. Historic properties can only convert if the State Historic Preservation Officer, the SHPO, which is DHR in Virginia, agrees with no historic properties are affected. You don't make that decision, DHR does. If you determine that you have to consult with some regulatory agencies, then you will proceed as a categorically excluded ER. And if you can see on this box on the PowerPoint, if you have a categorically excluded ER, you will use boxes one and two. If you have an environmental assessment level, then you would use just box three. Next slide, please. Then you need to determine the level of impact. So there are two levels of impact. You either have uh, not a major federal action, which is called a finding of no significant impact, also known as a FONSI, a, or you have a, metal, met, puh, a major federal action where it can significantly affect the quality of the human environment, known as a FOSI, waka waka. With a FOSI, you have to have an environmental impact statement. We don't want waka wakas, we want haze, so we want FONSIs. And remember, if you do need an environmental impact statement, you do need to contact your CDS immediately. Next slide. So the last part of the environmental review process is to publish and post your public notices and your request, your request of release of funds and certifications. So if you publish your uh, public notices, you need 15 days for comment period. And if you post them, you need 18 days. If you post your public notices, we need a picture where, where you posted it, and we need documentation on letterhead saying where and when you posted it and what newspaper you posted it in, or if you published it, what newspaper and when you published it. And you also need to ma mail and disseminate your public notices to your regulatory agencies. And here's a very quick thing. You need to make sure that you request a release of funds and certification are two-sided on one page, so it just needs to be one page so that your second page is not able to get lost. Next slide, please. And here is a calendar in the grant management manual that'll help you determine your timing. And so that really wraps up everything on how to actually do it. I want to get some quick reminders. Your environmental review is current for five years. And unless your project changes significantly, you have to accurately fill out your project description. You need to accurately and completely fill out your statutory checklist. No blank boxes are not available or not applicable. Your responsible entity is the culpable party should any information be act inaccurate and make sure you use current and correct forms found on HUD exchange or from us. Here is a slide of some resources that are very handy and completing the environmental review. And here is my contact information. So sorry, I kind of had to rush at the end. But if you have any questions, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to get to them. But if you want to email them to me, um, feel free to. Like my contact information was up there. And here is also your second picture for the scavenger hunt. So thank you all for listening to the environmental review process, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Kelly. We appreciate that. Um, we can, uh, we'll get the questions answered. Um, so we're getting ready to head into a break, it looks like.
I'll let Sherry talk about that, but stay tuned. Kind of a follow-up to Kelly 